Good morning. All right, so um, I'm loud and clear now. Cool. Thank you for being here. Um, and we're going to have some more discussion about the Sarah Song uh, article on multiculturalism. And just uh, like I was saying on Monday about um, I really am excited to hear your thoughts uh, and especially any like positions you have or suggestions or proposals for how to deal with um, with all the sort of complexities that come, the, the tension of different moral demands in how to uh, exist as a society that has a diverse set of cultures and lifestyles and communities um, that have lots of asymmetries between them, um, not just in terms of their values and practices, but also in terms of power structures and um, the article gets into historical stuff too, like the legacy of historical oppression, puts people into different groups, um, amounts of social agency, all, all sorts of things. Uh, there, there's so many different continuums of difference that exist, and yet we ha are in community in some ways, whether we like it or not, <laughs> or to different degrees, right? And question is, uh, as I was framing it on Monday, what does a fair integration look like? Or what does a just integration look like? Uh, how, how do we exist with one another given all of those types of differences? And you see in the article about all the different types of arguments for how to proceed on this and what are some of the concerns that people have about some of those approaches. Uh, but like I said, I'm, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts. And um, so our, our usual uh, game plan of clarification, consensus, and controversy definitely applies here. Um, I'm not going to do it in a super, <clears throat> I'm not going to run things today in a super formal or like restrictive model in terms of doing one thing or another. It kind of, as we've talked about before, makes sense to maybe do some clarification stuff first, but I'm happy to kind of follow everyone's lead here um, and try to have as rich of a conversation as we can in the two hours we got. So, Let's get started with it. I, I actually, um, I remember at the end of class on Monday, we had some things kind of on deck, uh, things that were lined up, and with just all the stuff that's been going on this week, I admit I lost track of them. I really should have written them down, um, but after I was like moving on with my other classes on Monday, uh, it just kind of went out of went out into the ether. So if you were sharing something, it seemed like people did have some stuff prepared um, on Monday during the Monday session. There was something that you shared on Monday that we didn't quite wrap up or kind of finish talking about or maybe even start very much. Um, please put it back down here um, in in the chat and and uh, let's discuss it. So um, any uh, maybe maybe before we get started with that, since this is like our last session together, um, if you do have any questions about what's going on, um, I can report that uh, I got a lot of them, the uh, missing um, paper papers last uh, by last night, and I did another exchange, uh, a secondary exchange anonymously for the response papers. Um, so almost all of you have uh, have a paper to work with now for the response paper, which is due at the end of the week. Um, but I want to see if there's any other questions people have about finishing up the quarter together. And I also wanted to kind of, even though I've talked about it before, just want to reiterate again how much uh, you are v absolutely welcome to reach out and contact me after the quarter is over too. Um, this doesn't have to be the last time we talk. Um, and I'm, I'm always very uh, excited about talking with students um, even if they're not in classes with me. So uh, I hope that going forward um, you think of me as a, a resource you've got in your back pocket and that you're always free to, to uh, employ or to, to reach out to me and talk about anything. Um, doesn't have to be something academic even. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I will always be tickled and happy to hear from you if, if that ever does occur. So I wanted to say that again. So yeah, anyone have any questions about finishing up the quarter? Any any um, business on that level?
Nope, everything's pretty clear at this point. That's good. I also wanted to um, make the announcement, uh, in case you haven't heard through any official channels yet, but I did receive um, notification, I think on uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, um, I heard from Bellevue College, I thought I'd just pass it along to you, that the school is moving to an online-only format for next quarter um, to last at least through April. So if you've got classes next quarter, uh, you can count on them at least starting online. And then um, also <clears throat> the school decided to have a delayed start to the new quarter. I think in part to help uh, instructors who are not used to teaching classes online, like get their shit together basically to make that happen. So the quarter, next quarter, spring quarter, is officially starting on the 8th of April. Um, so that's that's some news. I can pass along to you. Did did you receive uh, email? Anyone receive email notification about that? Yeah. First time hearing about it. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm happy. I'll, I made. Uh, I can pass that along then. Okay. So next quarter is uh, going to be shorter, but only by two days. So they're restructuring. Um, we're, we're basically only going to be losing two days. They're, they're keeping the same schedule for spring quarter, um, but we're going to lose like a professional development day. I think they're restructuring the way finals week is going to look to try to um, make up for some of the days that we miss by having the late start. And, and uh, the, the total math calculates out to just losing two days of the quarter. Yeah. So every, every we're kind of good on class mechanics, uh, and we can just start talking about multiculturalism. Ready to go? All right. Cool. So yeah. Um. Uh, my apologies for ooh. I had a sneeze there. <clears throat> mm. You're welcome. Um, so if you did have something that you threw into the chat at the end of class or during class uh, on Monday, um, please put it back in there. But what are what are people thinking? What are, um, you know, with all the different we had in the Sarasong article, it's kind of split into two halves. You've got arguments for multiculturalism. Um, the sort of what is the mandate here for for what's the moral mandate for doing something, especially around what's called the politics of recognition, uh, granting of special statuses or special rights um, or special limitations on what the government does, how people are treated in society that are asymmetrical versus other groups and why that might be right or what, what would be the moral justification for that. Um, and then the second half is all about certain critiques of multiculturalism, of this politics of recognition, and what other things, um, what are some of the other competing concerns with the arguments that are presented in favor of it, the justifications for multiculturalism. Um, so in, in all that material, is there anything that you have questions about that you I, I could try to clarify uh, or explain a little bit more? or just general questions you have about the topic or the controversy, uh, or anything that you, if you especially, um, like, I, like I said at the start, I'm curious about ideas you have about how, what's the right way to handle um, multicultural issues. So Mark says, there's something in the article about self-affirmation of culture as one of the many roads to true self-determination. What does that look like? Okay, so um, the the role that there there is a discussion that happens, a distinction about how culture is a thing of value itself, and and there's a distinction between whether we value it in an intrinsic way, 
or in an extrinsic way. And this is the same distinction we've talked about many times this quarter about valuing things for their own sake or valuing them as a means for something else. And things can be valuable in both ways. I mean, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, things being um, uh, valuable. The things that are valuable for their own sake are really important to pin down because they set the context for why anything else that has instrumental or extrinsic value that's valuable as a means, like how that's going to look. So depending on what your ultimate goals are, what other things you're going to see as valuable in promoting that goal will be different. Um, so culture itself um, maybe has some value, but one, one way to understand it in terms of this context of self-affirmation is that culture presents an opportunity for, for true self-determination, in other words, of having agency. So this could happen in a, in a number of different ways um, that I can anticipate. One, for example, being that uh, just having a community in which you're able to design a lifestyle um, is an expression of agency, of being able to uh, sort of build out a, a version of the world that is compatible with the things that you choose to value. Um, those, those sorts of choices. Um, as one, uh, build in another wrinkle here of the conversation. Do you remember the, uh, let's see, what was it? I got some notes here. It was in the section, um, do, do, do. Where was this? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, um, the cosmopolitan critique that was saying that, um, it's not the it's not the cultural systems themselves that have uh, the value here, but sort of the the cultures represent a raw material of options for someone to choose. So by say um, being more aware of multiple cultures, you've got some more resources for thinking about what actually does have value. So if um, and actually I can step back even further here. Um, think about a Kantian sense of self-determination, of being self-governing. This is a rational activity, right? And the same way Kant had problems with lying as for on, on the, the premise of agency being important, if you don't have information for something, then you can't make as much of a authentic decision about it. This is, this is why we think doctors have uh, ethical obligations, professional obligations toward their patients to give them the information about their medical conditions or what the different treatment options are and the consequences of those treatment options. Imagine a doctor that doesn't do this. If she's like talking to a patient and only presents one of the options and doesn't talk about the other ones or mentions them but doesn't you know, sort of talk about what their drawbacks are or what their risks could be, then in some ways that doctor is not um, put, giving the opportunity for the, for the patient to make a truly autonomous decision about what kind of health care they want to receive. Without being informed, their ability to be an agent is minimized. So in a similar way, if you are if you have access to other cultures and other models for how uh, you could find the meaning of life, how different models for what you could conceive of as virtue or happiness, then you've got less options for what to choose from. Like, uh, kind of imagine like being sheltered, right? You just are raised in a monoculture and there's no other options presented to you. Um, you then, maybe you're, you're not completely helpless here. Like you can still imagine other options that are different, but it might be a little harder. And to, to have access to these other forms of life, uh, these other ways in which people can exist and, and exist together uh, might increase your ethical imagination and put you in a better position to make true choices. I think this is part of the reason why uh, being, if you're a student, especially a student of philosophy, it's good to get ideas from all sorts of different places, to have, uh, to explore other cultural traditions. Um, I can definitely report on this as being a big part of, of my journey as a truth seeker and as an ethicist. I've received so many benefits from studying philosophies that don't exist in my culture uh, or from other time periods 
um, other places on the planet, um, just other ways of thinking. Uh, that that has has inspired my own efforts. In they even sometimes if I disagree with them, they can still inspire uh, new ways of thinking about what what do I really want to be about? What 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 values do I want to choose to have? So this could be one part. But there was a critique, a, a sort of reply to this point that said, well, yeah, cultures can have that kind of benefit. They can have that. They can perform that kind of function. But they also uh, without having it, it can't just be intellectual that it, it's also there needs to be an actual system of that culture happening for that choice to really be a realistic option instead of just something kind of academic like you can read about or watch a video about kind of like a, a history documentary or something if it if it doesn't e exist anywhere then as an option it's it's not as viable and um, that that's a potentially another consideration here. Um, I, am I answering your question, Mark? Uh, another thing I can kind of throw in here while you're typing. Um, so from a liberal perspective, like the liberal political philosophy um, sort of stance, um, <clears throat> having tolerance is always been a part of the program right that's been a kind of a core moral value to a lot of liberal philosophy is the, the importance of tolerance and not coercing people to have to participate in the same cultural system as a way of trying to respect people's freedom um, to to kind of pursue happiness or pursue a meaning of life or to pursue uh, liberty of conscience um, in their own independent way and if someone wants to be choosing for something that isn't necessarily popular <clears throat> or isn't the majority culture then maybe there are special obligations of society to protect that choice to make it more viable you, you maybe remember the discussion about intrinsic versus extrinsic burdens um, that if there's a certain choice and someone wants to make about how they're going to live their life that because it's not the dominant one, then it might involve all these other trade-offs that maybe aren't fair for them to have to make. Um, and that, that has to be explored, of course, but yeah. Um, oh, Mark, you stopped typing. Okay, there you go. Uh, would learning a different culture also precipitate its existence? Should it be viable in the dominant culture, even if the culture doesn't currently exist? Well, that, that's kind of what we're wondering about. Um, it'd be one thing to say, you can do what you want. It's another thing to know whether there are the opportunities for realistically living it out. Um, there are plenty of things I've thought about as like ways I would like to live that there's like not necessarily circumstantial opportunity for. And then you have to kind of make some trade-offs or decide as an individual like what am I going to do about these values that I have intentionally and sincerely chosen through a judgment uh, from reason through self-determination. How am I going to uh, live out a life that has commitment to those values when the world is not necessarily reflecting them or making it really hard to do so? Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, I, Hayden, I saw your your contribution too. I want to touch on that in a second. Um, before I do that, though, I, I did want to kind of just make a general comment here about this discussion. So, in the article, you get a bunch of arguments and objections and replies that happen and again this this article is just kind of an introduction to the topic Sarah Song doesn't necessarily argue for a conclusion here um, that she, she doesn't say this is the answer to the question and here's why or something like that she's just kind of uh, seeding the debate you know like getting a sense of the lay of the land the territory of the debate and when arguments are flying around like this and there's an objection let's say and then Sarah doesn't Sarah Song doesn't like pursue it any further than that. It doesn't mean that that objection or that argument is sort of final, that it like won the day, that there is no reply or something. You can't read that into the article. All the stuff that gets discussed is like a, a bunch of different facets of debate that can definitely be run more. And and I was I was talking with a student on the phone yesterday about this, and it can be a little. Um, it, it, it it's a I don't know what the word I'm looking for here. It was definitely a skill 
uh, or an ability or a character virtue or something like that that I remember as being a student of philosophy myself to, to remember that just because someone has something to say in reply doesn't necessarily mean that it is sufficient or effective. Um, and that's why we have to be critical thinkers about it. Every time there's an argument that, that someone drops a card on the table, be like, is that the last word or maybe not? Right? What else can be said about this? So I don't, I don't think that the, um, the song article necessarily like ties up any of these loose ends. And that's why I'm so interested to hear what, what you think about it and what your evaluations are, which arguments that you are, you found convincing, which ones you didn't find convincing, um, and any ideas you have about how to resolve all these sticky things. So Hayden, you said um, the article should have explained some historical difference more such as Israelites and the Palestinians, what do I think? Um, do you, are you, Hayden, are you wondering whether I agree that it should have had more of this historical discussion going on? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I can, I can kind of give you my, my two cents on this uh, a little bit. Um, there is going to be a question whether some of the idiosyncrasies or the contingencies of the particular cultures that we're talking about and maybe their historical story with one another could be relevant to what an acceptable resolution is. And some of the arguments that you saw in the article definitely speak to this, like um, the post-colonial uh, uh, sort of analysis is really sensitive in highlighting the historical story about where we've, what, what brought us to where we're at right now. And how does what happened historically still have an impact or contextualize or influence what's going on today, right? And how to handle diversity today, that there's a backstory to it. But the real question will be, what's going to be the significance of that backstory? How will you know which of those contingencies matter and which ones don't? Um, and the, the sort of general, more universal types of uh, considerations that are taking place in the, in the discussion. It is a theoretical discussion that's being had in this article, I think is the, the thing to be putting more of the attention on. Um, so in a, in a particular case, the details are going to matter. Um, the particularities of, say, what's going on in America today is relevant for what we should be striving to be, like what direction do we want to head in as a society. I don't, I don't think those could be factored out. But I'm also not surprised that um, Song didn't go into more detail about this because there are going to be so many different uh, contexts like that one that would have to be uh, addressed, uh, and it would be easy to get maybe distracted about it. Um, but I would be curious to hear from you, Hayden, you said that's an important factor in your view. What do you think is the significance of it? So going back to my idea of like, okay, there's going to be definitely contingencies about how particular cultures interact with each other and what their historical story is. Um, but the, there's still, those facts don't speak for themselves, right? There needs to be some kind of lens for, and maybe some principles that we bring to bear here about what is going to be the significance of that and what should we do about it? So I'm kind of curious to hear what you have in mind here. Mm. The fact that that history of conflicts between cultures still affects us today. Yeah, and, and it's, it's definitely not limited to the Middle East. Um, it's everywhere. A human history is a history of conflict <laughs> in many ways. I mean, that's a, that's a big theme. And uh, conflict is kind of what m multiculturalism is about, this whole debate. Um, conflict can happen in, in different ways. Like, you can have conflict just in terms of people having competing visions of how things should work in society. It can also happen in terms of like direct violence or the threat of violence. Um, I think I think it is worth looking at uh, other contexts and not just our own. I think it's very important to look at our own context. I would definitely agree with that. Um, and it can be useful and instructive to look at how these things play out in other places too as maybe shining a spotlight on certain facets that are relevant. So for example, um, you know, right now here, 
uh, we are tangentially affected by what goes on in the Middle East. Um, but what kind of uh, significance, what, what do you think the, the story of, the historical story of um, Palestinians and, and Israelites and, um, and also like the religious communities that are going on, like the Shiite and Shia like conflict that's been going on for a long time. What, what kind of lessons do you think we should take away about uh, the question of multiculturalism given that historical story? And everyone else in chat too, please uh, put put stuff in here. Um, kind of uh, questions, reactions, comments, suggestions, reports on like what stuff from the reading you uh, are interested in, agree with, disagree with, all that stuff. Oh, uh, Hayden says, good question. We'll need to think about that. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the the bottom line TLDR of my response to your question is um, details matter and history matters, um, but there's always a question of how does it matter? What, what is, what's the upshot, right? What's the, what are the lessons we're supposed to take away? Uh, I mean, there's that phrase that gets thrown around a lot, like people who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it, this kind of thing. Um, but the, it's, it's one thing to say we should be looking to history to, uh, you know, for insight or awareness, and it's another thing about how, <laughs> right? What, what, what are we taught um, when we see something happen in the past? How do, What is the lesson to take away? Yeah. Hello? <laughs> Anyone else got some things to, to throw in here for today? I also, I, maybe it's worth saying, I can imagine that this topic is one that is not, is definitely not just an, an intellectual one, but is one that is personal. Um, and not just because almost everything in ethics can get personal, but especially about how cultures and uh, are connected with our identities, um, just our existence in the world. And uh, there's a lot of like hooks and strings attached to that. Um, and I, uh, as I was talking about for you working on your papers, personal experience is not irrelevant to this discussion. Um, there, in, in our personal experiences, we can become aware of things that are absolutely relevant to people beyond just ourselves or to situations that are, are beyond just our, our specific context. Um, and there's a lot of questions that can happen just within that space too. So um, if you uh, are wondering about like how to, maybe, maybe you've got some thoughts and views or reactions or feelings or intuitions about this topic, if you're like, I don't know how to like express this in a philosophical way or in like a theoretical way, um, I w don't, don't let that stop you from sharing, because um, we can maybe work with that and figure out how what your attention is on sort of does plug into this this bigger conversation that's happening. Be very happy to help with that. If there is anything that's a barrier to participating in discussion today, uh, I'd love to know about it. Maybe we can do something about it too, to kind of frame this discussion so we can get as much participation as possible. That's something I, I have a priority on. Mark says, is it okay that cultures disappear? <clears throat> Such there uh, have been countless cultures that have ended, and yet their history is still present. 
Yeah, maybe, you know, um, their history is still present, but maybe in a way that has a different uh, reality than, um, than if that culture was still, like, active, right? So, like, Roman culture, is, you know, the Roman Empire is gone. <laughs> you know, it's really just a historical thing at this point. We, like, uh, can study it and try to imagine what life was like, or for people in Central America pre-colonialization um like we can we can sort of we we've got some historical evidence and about like trying to imagine what that how that society worked or what was going on with it but that's a very different thing than having it be actively practiced um and whether that's a loss or not is a question um there there still can be ripple effects right there's legacies that happen like there's a legacy of the fact that rome did its thing right or teotihuacan or something um those there's there still has that sort of influence but it's, it's more indirect and uh and whether there should be active expression of that culture uh is i think uh maybe not my my reaction would be it's probably not all good, all bad sort of thing. It's probably going to be a mixed thing. Maybe it depends a little bit on the culture itself. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the questions that's sort of looming around this whole discussion, I don't need to turn my hat for this one, is what is the legitimacy of culture based on? Do cultures just have a sort of Teflon shield up of like, well, it's a culture, so it's not criticizable. I mean, it seems like cultures can be criticizable. Where do they get their value and authority from is part of the question. And maybe a culture, maybe there are some things that should go away. I I, I think there's some things that should go away. <laughs> I think there's some cultures that don't need to be replicated and don't need to be continued um, that uh, really should be committed to the dustbin of history kind of thing. Um, but there's also others that might it'd be really sad to lose that I definitely have some some um, things in mind of things that I think uh, the world might be in a worse off place for not having in the mix um, so uh, mark you you worded this as a question um, again I'm kind of curious what do you think about it what is what's your position on that um, how would you approach answering that question um, and uh, while you're typing and thinking about that, Sam put in here, how much assimilation should or can a dominant culture expect or it's fair to expect from those who immigrate to the country? And do you think a, a society loses in having culture that is too hegemonic? Can it lose... Uh, oh, the grammar here is throwing me off. Can it lose from have a too wide a range of cultures? Um, uh, oh, I think you're saying, uh, is there a problem if there's a lack of cohesion, uh, with all the like diverse cultures that exist in, in, in the country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I understand you're right. Let me know. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sam. Um, this is, this is another big question to be asking. This is part of what I was talking about on Monday about, um, uh, integration seems like a, a good thing under multiculturalism. But what, what does fair integration look like and how extensive should it be um, is one of the, the aspects to unpacking that question. Um, so Sam says, is there a problem if cultures are too divergent so you end up with a bunch of sub-societies in one nation? So I know that, that there's some definitely some weird aspects to um, throwing this historical card on the table, but when America was just in its infancy, um, Europeans uh, referred to it as the great experiment and this that wasn't necessarily a compliment <laughs> it was more of an expression of of like um, uh, doubt um, and skepticism that this could happen and uh, you know America was not a uh, and has never been a pure uh, expression as I've said many times before of egalitarian principles uh, or of cultural diversity um, I mean even before um, something like the the sort of unique brand of of cultural identity in America that we might call whiteness, um, before that was kind of emerging, there was a ton of of uh, intolerance, discrimination, 
and racism and prejudice that was happening between different European ethnic and cultural groups um, within the colonies. Um, this happened all the time, and, and immigrants coming from Europe, um, even when you're thinking most of the people holding the reins of power in um, in the colonialized America are what we would recognize today as white people. They were not some kind of unified power base, and you had all this kind of diversity happening within them, and they understood themselves as not being necessarily part of one cultural or ethnic community. So when the Europeans are referring to this derisively as the great experiment, they're thinking, can you have a society that has so much diversity, that's like this mix of all these different people? And in, even though the sort of the, I would argue that the context has shifted for how to understand where those differences are uh, at this point in the 21st century, America still very much is this. Um, how much can we continue to be a society together? I'm, I'm not sure the experiment is over, right? <laughs> that it's sort of been decided where this has gone. Um, this is still an ongoing experiment. Um, and a lot of its success depends on our strategy for how to approach it. Uh, and one big question in terms of strategy is about um, how, how much diversity can be tolerated uh, and which, which things, right? Um, so uh, I would, again, not, uh, you, you keep putting questions out here. I'm happy to answer them to my, the best of my ability. But I'm also really he interested to hear, like I said, what's your perspective on it? Where are you at? Even if you're not really confident about it, uh, throw it out there. This is an absolute safe space for us to, to kind of think critically and be vulnerable and just discuss these ideas. They're important things to talk about. Um, but, uh, one other connection here at the reading for your comments, Sam. Remember um, the, what was it, what was the label of it? The, oh, the diversion from class inequality objection that said um, that they had that distinction between the cultural left and the progressive left. We talked about this. I, I think we touched on it a little bit on Monday, that there's a potential for this politics of recognition or an emphasis on multiculturalism to distract from class inequalities or economic inequalities and injustice. And the premise of this objection is that uh, in order to really make progress on those issues of social justice, we have to see ourselves as part of one culture or one society to be more integrated together rather than splintered off. That uh, the splintering actually works counterproductively. You maybe have heard people talk about this uh, in contemporary discussions. I see it's more in popular discussions like, say, on the Internet and stuff in politics about how um, one way that a hegemonic power or a dominant power can retain its power is by uh, making all the other groups sort of fight between themselves, like set them off against each other a little bit. And even if there isn't antagonism, I think the concern from this objection um, is something like without the social cohesion, they aren't really going to be able to be empowered allies to redefine or have a true like revolution or reform of the, the sort of economic structures of our society um, and, and how the, that game is played. Um, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with it, but that I think is the articulation of the concern. Um, so there's a connection there. Um, okay, so uh, moving, now uh, we've got a bunch of people in the chat. This is great, this is great. Okay, so Mark says, I think it's okay, um, and the it may be co covering a couple different themes here. Um, Mark, we're talking about what was it that I asked you? <laughs> What's the it in the that pronoun there? Um, it's okay so long as the dominant culture does not leave persons in a worse off state than the one. Lo oh, right, right, right. For the loss of cultures, I think it's okay as long as uh, for a culture to be lost, as long as the dominant culture does not leave persons in a worse off state than the one lost. I don't know if there's a moral reason for, say, Chinese marriage ceremonies to exist. Um, it might also be like, what's the problem if they do? Right? Um, there, that could kind of go... There, there's a lot of cultural diversity where it maybe is not that big of a deal if we're not on the same page about it or not, right? Like, uh, especially uh, certain, like, rituals or ways of expressing something. Um, we can tolerate a lot of diversity there without really getting into any sticky moral matters. But there's other things that do maybe clash in, a, in that we can't all 
do it our own way. Um, and then we're going to have to start picking and choosing some of that stuff. Like a lot of the cultures that I would be like, yeah, for this to die, <laughs> for this to go away, wouldn't be a problem, are the ones that do pose tension for some of the other things that we think of as really fundamental moral values for social justice. Um, and that that's one of the tensions here, right? Um, if we're concerned about big picture social justice, it seems like there's a pressure for that to be universal so that it's not just the double standard. But then how does that square with wanting to allow for disagreement to happen, to have tolerance for disagreement and diversity of opinion and lifestyle in the society? Um, Hayden said, my grandfather used to tell me about all the anti-Semitism because growing up he was Jewish. Um, this this touches closely to to um, my life too because my um, my partner is Jewish and uh, she um, comes from a family that was uh, directly in the Holocaust and there's a lot of family trauma about it um, and so the the aftershocks of that in America. You know where the Holocaust was not happening. There's still is anti-Semitism, um, and that that was definitely a, a major, major contextualizing feature for just being for the family being in America once they came over here. Um, Sam said, "I've heard national identity thrown around as a reason to have strong borders and expect assimilation from immigrants, but does it really serve a purpose besides unifying a nation in competition with another nation?" It seems like local community is a lot more important than national identity or national community. Um, isn't that where intersectional cooperation is? Uh, oh, I think that comment was picking up on a different thread here. Um, yeah, and at least for people's day-to-day -day lives, Sam says. So actually, this reminds me of something that I was seeing in the reading comments. Um, let me pull this up. Some people, a, a bunch of people, um, mentioned... Um, or remarked about this connection between multiculturalism and nationalism that Sarah Song uh, mentions. And I think people might have misinterpreted this to um, be something stronger than what she's actually saying about this. Let me find it here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is in the introduction. So here's what she says in the second paragraph. Um, so there's this idea of group differentiated rights. Some group differentiated rights, um, oh, this, is, this is part of the, the politics of recognition. Um, some group differentiated rights are held by individual members of minority groups, as in the case of individuals who are granted exemptions from generally applicable laws in virtue of their religious beliefs, or individuals who seek language accommodations in education and in voting. Um, so maybe there, people are given some alternative way to vote, for example, in order to deal with the language barrier. Um, other group differentiated rights are held by the group qua group. So not as the individuals of, of those minority groups, but by the group itself, um, rather than by its members severally. Such rights are properly called group rights, as in the case of indigenous groups and minority nations who claim the right of self-determination. So, so think about um, um, reservations that have different rules for how they are subject to what is going on with the federal government laws. Um, and state government laws, right? They're given their own sort of autonomy in a way that other, uh, like cities, you know, or, or local communities in America do not have. They don't have those rights. Um, so there's some asymmetry there. But maybe there's some justification for it. And then, and then Song says this. Um, in the latter respect, multiculturalism is closely allied with nationalism. And this she's not saying this goes across the board she's talking specifically about the idea of group differentiated rights that attach to the group qua a group okay so as uh especially on grounds of self-determination so that the expression of people's agency within their community to have their community operate in a certain way not necessarily what what those individual people are allowed to do but what that group is allowed to do whether that group is allowed to have say social authority in governing locally what's going on is she's saying connected with the idea of nationalism now 
I wish it went a little further on this because nationalism can be understood in a lot of different ways. Um, but with nationalism, maybe a low-hanging fruit here for how to think about what's going on with this um, is that nationalism emphasizes your membership in a nation as being an important part of your identity and something that is prescriptive, that, that gives you um, direction on, at least in part, about how to make decisions and what, what should be sort of how, how you should be devoting your life energies and stuff like that. Um, to promote the interests of the nation is nationalism. And this can happen for even a local community. If you, um, like, or maybe a, a community that exists on a reservation, that they have an understanding of their nation, which is independent of some other nation like America, right? They're, they're, that they're in this geographical territory doesn't necessarily mean that they identify with that national identity. They may have another national identity. And the idea that there should be group rights, especially on the basis of self-determination, is the same kind of logic that you see behind justifications for state sovereignty um, that that happen in the liberal tradition, like we saw from Locke, for example, that people have the right to determine how they will be governed. And some of these group differentiated rights that multiculturalism is trying to make space for are just saying, yeah, that can happen maybe for a minority group that exists in a larger minority society or a majority society. That could happen too. Is this making some more sense? So Sam, kind of connect, to connect it with what you're saying, um, let, let's go back to your, your text here. You said, I've heard national identity thrown around as a reason to have strong borders and expect assimilation from immigrants. So we'll, we'll talk about this in a second. But does it really serve a purpose besides unifying a nation in competition with another nation? And the answer to that question maybe we could now say is potentially yes, that there are other purposes for this, basically on the grounds of self-determination. You say it seems like a uh, local community is a lot more important than national identity or national community. Well, that's another part of what makes America interesting, that it is so big as a nation, that it isn't more limited. But then, you know, which, which sense of, of community identity are we working with? It doesn't necessarily need to be the one that is the federal state government, right? You could identify a lot more maybe with your state, or you could imagine your city, right? It was like a city-state, like an ancient Greek city-state like Athens or something, right? Um, and that also would be playing out the same kind of function as what happens if you're sort of identifying with the fact that you're in this bigger scope community of America or something like that. Now, however that group is defined, this self-determining group, however small in scope or large in scope, then there's this question about what is an ethical expectation for assimilation. So let's say you've got a small group in your neighborhood and someone moves into your neighborhood. So let's just keep it local. We don't have to make it like the big, big bad federal government kind of thing. Say you've got a neighborhood and you have community, you know, you have like a neighborhood association or something, and then someone wants to move in. And let's even say that, um, they can't just uh, be allowed to do this because they buy the property, because that's the, how the rules work in a lot of cases in our society. You just buy the property, and now you're in the community, right? It's through an economic action that you gain legitimate membership. But let's say that you had to be uh, sort of cleared by that local, this is like an extreme gated community. Are you able to imagine what I'm throwing down so far in this thought experiment? Is this making sense? So a new person is going to join your community. They do need your consent to do it. So that would try to make this parallel to something like immigration, like legal immigration. How reasonable is it to expect that person to conform to what you've already got going on in your local community? That, that would be kind of a similar kind of question. Is this making sense? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, you know, it's not the same as like being a guest in someone's home where you're like, 
I'm the guest. So maybe there's some like social expectations and intuitions that you know you play by the rules of the person that you're a guest at because you're you're not a guest if you're moving into this neighborhood. You're like going to be a full-fledged legitimate member of that community. Same thing with immigration. Immigrants are not like permanent guests in America. If they are uh, accepted into the country, they are being given status of citizenship theoretically that is just the same as for anybody else whether that translates in practice is another thing and that's the same thing that could happen in our imagination of a local community that has a new member coming in as well even if they are officially uh, accepted you know they may not have the same kind of like seniority in the social community you know the kind of the structure of of how that community operates um, that they might be up against right um, but they're, they're de it definitely is wrong to say that there's some kind of permanent guest. Um, so what, what would you, if the new person comes in and starts throwing around a bunch of criticisms about how we sh things should be done differently, is that appropriate? How, what should the community do about that? What do you think? What, what do you think is the level of assimilation that is appropriate? This is the, this is the big question, right? What does fair integration look like? I think my toddler is playing with the front door. <laughs> I keep feeling like, huh? People are typing. Well, I could even elaborate on our analogy here of, of kind of keeping it within the scope that you're that you're interested in playing on Sam of, of like more local communities of imagining that it's not just one person who comes into that community but maybe they come in and then a bunch of other people come in that are sort of like-minded like them at one point should there be like oh well they've got their own thing going on that's different from everyone who was there before and what they how they wanted to have things work in this local neighborhood community, um, when it, might they be given some special dispensation? Should they be receiving some special dip dispensation to kind of maybe not play by all the rules that were laid down before uh, or how other people want to do it? How do we decide about that? Um, Mm -hmm. I'm going to wait for Mark to get his thing in here. Okay, Mark says, wouldn't a truly fair integration be a conversation of different values, perhaps between different cultures, and finding middle ground toward the highest ethical degree, just as an ideal situation? So some of the authors uh, that Sarah Song talks about in the article do uh, address this idea of um, dialogue and public discourse as maybe the way to proceed about this. That one of the problems with, say, the his historical injustices um, and inequalities in society is that not everyone's had voice in that conversation or that their perspectives are not like fully understood or being listened to or contextualized in the way that those people understand themselves. Um, so there's misunderstanding that can happen that prevents them from being fairly evaluated and what they have to contribute being fairly evaluated. This could be a, an emphasis. Um, what was the section that really focused on this? Um, I mean, this was kind of a theme that showed up a couple times. Um, 
certainly the post-colonial stuff gets into this because it's connected. Having voice is really important for self-determination and full full participation in that society. Um, I think it was kind of in the universalist ideas of equality too here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, the post-colonial stuff it definitely is really relevant too. Um, yeah, um, but uh, whether whether that's going to be sufficient here. Uh, will there be agreement that's arrived at uh, that we, we would be able to figure that out is a major question. Um, and whether a middle ground is going to be the best ground. Um, it may not. Like just a straight up compromise isn't always the right answer. Especially if there are other considerations of justice in the area, like what the feminist critique brought into this conversation um, about how uh, making accommodations um, for some of these uh, other group cultures may involve violating other kinds of moral values that we think of as being centrally significant and important. Um, okay, let's see here. Sam says, uh, but I, I'd love to hear more about what you have in mind there, Mark, about how that could look. Um, it, it might be, I, I mean, I'll put this too. This comes uh, up in... Um, when I teach my business ethics class, I keep talking this quarter about how these two classes, my political philosophy class this quarter and, and this business ethics class I've been teaching for a while, how there's a lot of parallels and overlap. We do a unit on international business that gets into these issues of multiculturalism and diversity. Um, and uh, one of the papers that we read in that class's curriculum talks about how there can be a new, there are new things that can be built that aren't just a matter of one culture winning or another culture winning or some kind of ham-fisted compromise between them, but at, that in being related to one another, to having these cultural communities in some kind of meaningful dialogue and shared decision-making or things like that, that we can create new cultures that are improvements on all of the ones that we've had previously. So I know, Mark, you, you're thinking about this uh, whether culture survive or die or this kind of thing. Um, maybe there is some something better that we could construct together that we don't just have to choose from um, these uh, cultural traditions that have been defined previously. One of the other points I think is very interesting that came up in, in Song's article is the danger of essentializing cultures, of saying, well, this culture is like um, is just this way, right? This is what defines it. And it's like it's a static thing. And it's not. That cultures are constantly in flux and evolving and changing. And there's never been a, really a time in history in which things have stayed pat. Um, and when people try to do that, which definitely humans have tried this, over the, this is one of our, seems like one of our major tendencies, is once we've got a hold of something, then we try to preserve it, right? And, and resist it from being changed. This kind of conservatism that can happen. And I don't mean that in any way other than a very broad abstract sense of just like trying to preserve and retain the, the essence of this thing. And that doesn't always uh, work out so well. Not, not just in terms of it leading to unjust practices, but just that it fails in its object. Um, that the efforts to have things stay the same just it never it never occurs um, and so maybe maybe part of your suggestion is just like accepting that um, and just kind of moving on but there will still be a question of how to do that right that's what I was saying like how would this dialogue happen how would we decide what maybe it wouldn't just be pure compromise right oh we'll do this and get you do this exchange kind of thing about it but um, what should be directing that conversation and how will we arrive at decisions about how to be um, as a society. Sam says, I think in large part it also depends on the culture that already exists in the community. How invasive it is could affect how offensive difference is to its membership. Okay, so um, by invasive maybe you mean restrictive, like how how much certain things are deal breakers for that culture right like how tolerant or intolerant that culture is itself like to tolerance is itself a culture um, as gets remarked in the article um, but it also uh, it seems 
like a new culture entering a community and criticizing it is just as bad as the dominant culture criticizing the others but maybe less consequential because it doesn't have as much power or influence I, I might put that in there maybe that might be why but new cultures should be expected to be just as tolerant as dominant ones um, this is a lot to discuss on a phone keyboard yeah 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 uh, wish you had a, a swipe I can do a lot of stuff on my phone through swipe but yeah yeah, it takes, it's maybe a little hard to do on the phone. Thank you for your effort, Sam, and to be able to participate in the discussion. I really appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this kind of, uh, I think I was dropping the idea a little earlier in our conversation today about, you know, do cultures have any de facto or, or not de facto, but like pre-theoretical legitimacy just by being a culture itself? Like, are our should cultures be immune from criticism or what kind of criticism or when we're trying to protect them what is the the basis of a justification for that is, is a real question that needs to be cashed out um, Mark says perhaps dialogue even needs to be enforced as you suggested yesterday between different groups as it should be between different individual persons yeah so mark that that switch is kind of like something you saw from the article uh, where there are some views that say um, there are not there are no such things as group rights um, there are only individual rights and so when we're thinking about how to navigate diversity and disagreement and exist as a tolerant society with one another we need to think about how we're respecting individual people and we shouldn't think of the cultures themselves or maybe the groups themselves that the, the, the cultures that bring people into groups as having any kind of independent legitimacy on their own again just to kind of um, I don't want to get too distracted with the, the business thing here, but um, another topic that comes up in the business ethics class that's sort of related to this is about businesses. Businesses are social institutions. They're little communities. And they are given uh, status you know, in society by our, by our own laws and government. Um, our, the U.S. government treats a business, a firm, as a person. That it has a lot of the rights that we confer onto individuals and people you know that's kind of controversial like is that a good thing is that a bad thing is it appropriate is it not appropriate yeah mark says to force conservative cultures to create new cultures with others yeah that and that would be kind of invasive itself to use um sam's word here right um that uh and when is that appropriate when when can this be demanded um that a lot of that depends on what's the moral justification behind it hayden says no culture is immune from criticism they all have their own faults in my view and hayden that is a, a very kind of classical uh, liberal response um to this question that um cultures that are are accountable to morality morality is what it's really about but this is where there's kind of a weird chicken and egg kind of catch-22 situation that happens. If we have different ideas of what that moral thing looks like, then how do we deal with those disagreements? Um, do we just kind of be like, well, I think I'm right, so I'm just going to keep running on that? <laughs> you know, that's, that could be part of part of what we we want to have a, a meta uh, system to adjudicate. Um, I personally I agree with you Hayden that just because uh, a bunch of people practice something doesn't mean it has more legitimacy that it's the it's more right for that to happen or more morally permissible um, that so I managed to turn my hat on this one I kind of think about it like the um, it's very parallel here to just an individual having an opinion everyone can have an opinion cultures are basically group opinions that are then embodied into a power structure just the same way as an individual might act on their opinions of what their values are. Um, but they can be right and wrong. An individual can be right and wrong, I think, in terms of their opinion. And so can a, a group. A group can be wrong, too. But we also, take on the individual level, think that self-determination and autonomy is important. And that we shouldn't just have people being paternalistically shepherded into making having certain opinions or making certain choices that there's something morally significant about people coming to those decisions sort of under their own power or being able to make choices about that and then you could extend that in the analogy to maybe that happening for a group as well that that's part of the the the, the tension here it's like um you can be wrong and it seems like there's some value here on autonomy and agency for an individual and maybe that can happen on the group too 
Um, I, I wanted to kind of uh, check in here for a second. We're about halfway through our session. And on these two-hour sessions, I think it can sometimes be good to kind of take a break in between. If we were on campus together doing this, I definitely would have a little short, you know, like five, ten minute break uh, to kind of just like, whew, okay, where, where are things going? Um, check in with yourself. Um, there's a lot of people who are in chat today that I haven't heard anything from, and I really would like to hear from them. I mean, I've heard from Hayden, Sam, and Mark, and I think that might be it. Sorry if I'm forgetting anyone, but that's kind of who have been in this conversation so far. And I'm having fun talking with you, and I appreciate your contributions, but um, I would really, really like to hear from some more people who and 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 hear your sort of takes and reactions and maybe even just to do a personal report on where you're at with this stuff, um, just to get involved. Um, I would be very and I've been talking a lot here too. I'd like to hear more from from what other people are thinking as well. So maybe let's take a, a short break, and um, you can kind of think about what you might want to contribute. Like take a little uh, check in, and um, let's come back in in five ten minutes here and keep and keep going for the rest of our session. Does that sound good to everybody? I'm not going to lose anybody if we take a break. <laughs> That's always what I'm worried about. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's do it. All right. Well, we're back. Um, how did the break go? Anything come up? Like I said, I'd definitely love to hear from some more people, too. Made some noodles. Nice. Just realized I've had this backlogged since we started the lecture, Anthony says. Why make the distinction between the progressive and cultural left? Their goals seem to have a lot of overlap and intersection. Yeah, this is one of the things that uh, gets talked about in the article. Um, the sort of reply to that concern Um one of the possible replies here is that they do have a lot to contribute to each other. Um, I, the, one, of, one of the concerns was that maybe um, uh, that this is, rests on an empirical claim, right? That um, to what extent does the emphasis on multiculturalism end up detracting? Or that it has this kind of social impact of distancing groups from each other, that you don't build this like broad coalition or something like that um, that's necessary for the the reform on class and economic issues. Um, maybe maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. We kind of need to do some more research to figure out if we even have to make the choice. Um, but yeah, I think one one question for that reply, if you wanted to say, hey, why do these things have to be in competition with each other, uh, would be to to identify what are the the oh, what are the places of intersection and overlap. So what do you see, Anthony? What are um, what are the goals that you? Th how would you articulate that uh, convergence? Absolutely, you can get on the mic. Yeah. I will relate your stuff on my microphone for the people watching this on YouTube later because they won't be able to hear. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yep. Mm Okay, so if I'm hearing you right, just to reiterate what you said for the people on YouTube later, um, you're saying that a lot of times the cultural inequalities uh, end up translating into class inequalities anyway. Is that is that right? Do I have you right? Mm hmm And I, I think that there's a really strong case to be made for that, um, that the a lot of the main mechanisms, especially if we're thinking about the, the real explicit cases of discrimination that basically everyone in this conversation is like that's bullshit right this isn't this isn't what a just society a, a just multicultural society should look like there shouldn't be this massive discrimination but a lot of times that discrimination the mechanisms of it have been economic and class based right like um 
think think back. I don't know how many of you actually did take a look at that Coates article from weeks prior uh, about the case for reparations. And Coates does a great job going through, like Hayden was asking for, the historical details of um, of racism in America, and so many of them are based on what kinds of opportunities a group of people have for participating in the rest of society. But I think maybe one, one facet here that's a little different, if we're not thinking about these like really egregious cases of, of bigotry or uh, discrimination or something like that, is that, that sort of premises that people want to be involved or that they should be given equal access to what is sort of the, the dominant cultural societal system. What if they don't want that? What if instead this whole stuff about politics of recognition is about giving giving them the social the, the the sort of legitimacy to opt out of certain things or to not participate in some of the other systems that that are conditioning how the society functions? Some of these other like cultural institutions, social institutions, um, that kind of changes the the discussion a little bit, right? Um, it, there could be a presumption that whatever the dominant culture is doing are the things that are valuable and that someone should want to have access to, and maybe those are uh, a certain group stands against that, right, and doesn't want to be participating in that certain way. Does that does that make sense as like a kind of making this little, throwing a little monkey wrench into the gears? Ringing bells with Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like uh, like we don't want to be equal <laughs> with your system, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, we want to do our our own thing. Um, that's independent of that. Like you you use the word separatist. Yeah. Um. Maybe, maybe it's worth pointing out that like um, an economic system is one of those aspects of how a society gets structured that it's much harder to um, not participate in. Like how the resources are going to flow um, and get distributed is um, harder to imagine how you've got these like little separate communities that happen. Uh, at least under capitalism, that's really hard because part of the whole function of capitalism is allowing for more um, fluidity or liquidity of how resources get moved around, right? To like the the way that capitalism thrives on more open trade in terms of increasing market efficiencies and things like that. That usually gets promoted pretty heavily. Um, so there, it's pretty hard to say well, our community stands against capitalism, so we're not going to participate. <laughs> you know, you can, it, it, it's, that's where the rubber meets the road in a lot of cases. Um, does that make sense? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mark says, is there such a thing as positive discrimination, such as toward cultures or ethnic groups in affirmative action? Or is there another way to offer greater opportunities? So yeah, this is a, a really good clarification. I feel like we've maybe touched on this before. Maybe I'm misremembering, though. But it might have just been through some conversations I've been having with people outside of class. The, the idea of discrimination, in a mo the most neutral definition of it, is really just treating people differently. A asymmetrical rules. And as I know we've talked about this idea before, that treating people in different ways is not inherently illegitimate, right? Um, there can be grounds for why it's equitable to to have different treatment of different people. Hey, Luke. Got I, oh, cool. I'm still you teaching here, but... You, awesome. That's really exciting. Sorry. Um, so, uh, shoot. <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. Okay. So... Um, there's a difference between, we might say, just and unjust discrimination. And a lot of times when we use the word discrimination, we're thinking about the unjust forms of it. Um, but there's a major questions about whether there are just forms of this. We do affirmative action in my business ethics class, and I get to bring it back to the business ethics thing. But affirmative action is 
making the case that this is a kind of asymmetry of how people are treated that is morally appropriate. And everyone who's ever been a defender of affirmative action has had to square off against the objection that this is just another form of discrimination and is objectionable on the same grounds that, you know, the, the historical unjust discrimination operates. And I, I do think just as a, a kind of just dipping our toes into this a little bit, uh, there's a pretty easy response to that objection. Um, one, one philosopher that I, I use in that curriculum says, well, in terms of the intentions and the effects and consequences of uh, affirmative action or reverse discrimination, as it's sometimes called, is completely unlike these forms of traditional discrimination that involve bigotry and stuff. Um, traditional discrimination, he argues, is premised on thinking of people as morally unequal, that some people's interests matter more than others um, on grounds that are arbitrary, like race or or cultural community or something like that um, that shouldn't be the, or, or sex or uh, religious orientation or something like that that those are not the kinds of things that are morally relevant bases for difference and that the effects of traditional discrimination involve things like prejudice um, animus uh, and pr promote inequality um, they are more divisive and something like affirmative action or reverse discrimination, it doesn't have those intentions. Affirmative action is not based on a premise that says, say, uh, historically disenfranchised groups matter more than other groups, uh, morally speaking, or that the, the goal is to create a situation of inequality. It's actually trying to work toward the goal of equality. So if, we're, if we evaluate things morally based on, at least in part, what sort of intentions are behind it, what's the goal, and what are the actual consequences of what we do, then these things cannot be given the same kind of moral evaluation. Does this argument make sense? Is it just intelligible, what I'm throwing down? Yes, no, maybe maybe it's a little complicated here. Uh, just while you're typing, Mark, um, the connection here with our discussion is that something like the multicultural politics of recognition is talking about special uh, rights or privileges that would be given um, asymmetrically. So they they also stand in need of some kind of special justification. Um, Mark says yes because my response paper is on affirmative action. Lots of insight. Cool, cool. Um, one uh, one other little wrinkle I can throw in here is. Um, When we're, think about how Sarah Song set up the article. We're wondering about what to do about multiculturalism, recognizing the context that some cultural groups have more power and influence than others. Like some might be the dominant or the hegemonic culture. And then others are less represented or have less power in society. That, I mean, that's part of the context of understanding the diversity that occurs. Um, that if we want to treat people in different ways or think that there are special rights or privileges or special moral obligations that we have to people differently based on that kind of context, that stands in need of special justification. And the whole first part of the article is all about what could those justifications be. That it's, it, it does need a justification. And that justification does need to take the form, I, this is my kind of commentary, of some kind of universal ethical appeal that even if at a more grounded, sort of embodied, contingent in circumstances sort of level, we treat people differently, there still needs to be some kind of common pattern um, that isn't just based on arbitrary double standards for why that would be the case. So for example, if we think um, like Kant's right and some kind of ethics of self-determination and respect for people's dignity as being self-determining agents is morally important, then when we put that into a specific contingent set of circumstances where some people in society are given more uh, room for expressing their agency than others, then that could be a reason. <coughs> Pardon me. <laughs> hmm. That could be a reason for maybe having different policies for different groups of people. 
premised on a universal value where it's not like some people somehow deserve more respect than others in this Kantian sense of respect for dignity. It's just because the circumstances are asymmetrical, what it looks like to express that universal moral value looks different. Okay? Um, so Anthony says, is this relating to the universalist appeal? Yeah, what I'm kind of throwing down right now is that this is always going to be required. So my, my hat's fully turned here. There, there's going to have to be some non-arbitrary, non-question-begging be basis to, to give a legitimate defense of treating people in different ways. One way that this definitely gets problematized is the recognition that any system that we set up for what those universal values are kind of looks like it might be another culture. This is part of the, the post-colonialism uh, contribution to the conversation. That even liberal values, say premised on things like Kant's philosophy of dignity and autonomy, uh, is itself something that is a different way of thinking than how some cultures understand ethical action and how we ought to live with one another, etc. And when there's tension between those, then it, it's, it is a really sticky dilemma to figure out how to resolve it, right? Um, I think this is embodied very well. Uh, a really good example of it is in the feminist critique about how giving special um, self-determining powers to certain cultural communities um, maybe protects them from some kind of uh, oppressive force uh, that or coercive force that happens from the dominant culture, but there can still be internal uh, discrimination that happens against certain people with that are within that cultural community based on how that that uh, community sets up their standards of self determination. Specifically, the um, the marginalized individuals that might exist within that. The feminists are thinking certainly of women here, but also plenty of other groups too that are very commonly um, under acknowledged uh, and or disempowered in some cultural contexts the minority within the minority yeah yeah I agree Anthony I think it's a it's a really great insight <laughs> it's a good thing to be tracking as a part of the mix here yeah Mark says would uh, expanding on the Mac uh, maxi min principles such as something like universal basic income also expand cultural autonomy um, I mean potentially uh, that's a that's kind of a actually a really loaded question uh, to to evaluate at least in my 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 way of picking up on it. Um, first of all, if we're premising something like capitalism uh, that the society operates in this sort of way, then a lot of personal agency depends on your ability to to participate in the economy. So if you have more money, then your ability to kind of live a life that's that fits with your cultural values is that much higher um, there's less you know m money kind of within a capitalist society gives you a right to do all sorts of things <laughs> in like a free market right um, if you don't have it then your ability to uh, maybe do something different or deviant from the rest of what the the culture's got going on is that much more limited um, and this is something that um, some of the, the uh, when we were doing, you know, Nozick, Rawls, and Cohen, they're kind of sensitive to here. That um, it, let's say you, you don't have a lot of money. Then you're, well, actually, I guess this is a contribution I'd make. I've observed for a, for a while now, or the, the thought has been in my mind, that the biggest thing the, that in a capitalist society that money gives you freedom for is that you don't have to be related to other people as much if you've got a bunch of money you don't need to be working cooperatively with others as much to make ends meet or have you know express your agency and, and achieve the projects and goals that you have you can just pay people if you don't have a lot of money now you're put into a different position now you have to coordinate with others um, to be able to achieve your ends, right? To pursue your ends and, and, and meet with some success on them. And if you have to work with other people, now there's going to be a lot more of those trade-offs, right? You have you have to get into some, like you have to confront things like multiculturalism way more 
if you don't have economic power than if you do. This is one of the privileges of, of, of wealth. And not one that I necessarily think is a good one, right? That actually is maybe a problem. Maybe in some ways, I would turn my hat even further here. I would say, this is a kind of a hot take. I'd say on an ethical lens of looking at things, really broad scro scope in terms of meaning of life and personal virtue, in some ways, poverty is a blessing. That it, it Because it forces you into a confrontation with that, you have a confrontation with it. That stuff might be on your radar. You're you're kind of forced to adapt into a pro-social way of operating. Now we definitely fail with that, and then there, there's going to be tragedies involved with that. But um, you know, I, I've you know I'm a Christian, um, and there's a, one of the sayings of Jesus is it is harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. This is an often quoted thing. And all kingdom of heaven kind of really means here is uh, being connected with, or I, I will give a gloss on it right now. This is controversial. I don't want to get into scriptural exegesis here in theology. But kingdom of heaven would be like participating with righteousness and justice, um, like having a life that's in line with that. That that's that is the kingdom of heaven. It's kind of like the the ethical space of oughts that doesn't necessarily apply into what actually happens in terms of power and circumstance in this world. Um, but how, why, you know, what would be the argument behind Jesus's claim here? Like, why is it so hard for rich people to do this, to be able to live lives of justice and ethics and righteousness? It might be because their wealth shields them from having to confront the issues of living in community with other people. And if you don't, if you're, you're sort of forced in that way, then then there's the opportunity to engage with that a little bit more. Um, so universal basic income maybe has an advantage here. Uh, so going back to your original comment here, Mark, um, having universal basic income gives people more space for agency and participation with society. That's true. And maybe not in a way that is problematic for what I'm talking about in terms of the the deficiencies of wealth or the the sort of unideal privileges that come with wealth um, universal basic income is to protect you against the like survival based needs um, that you may not have economic power to engage with um, so that that I think is a, a good thing and would expand cultural autonomy um, but it, there, it also, there, I'm kind of throwing into the mix about this, that there still is a question about how we want to coordinate together. And that's why the maxim in principle, for you to bring up Rawls here, is very interesting. Um, how would a Rawlsian, thinking about things under their veil of ignorance, deal with the multiculturalism stuff? Um, another, another little take from me here. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in a two cents. And I, I still would love to hear from some more people here. Um, the ch chat's been kind of dead, so I just keep talking. But... Um, I would like to hear from other people here too, but I'll, I'll throw this little uh, this little nugget in. Um, a lot of times, when we think about issues of diversity and multiculturalism, and not necessarily about the economic stuff directly, the way that Rawls is really focused on, like if you're rich versus poor, you're gonna have a different conception of social justice. You might have a different conception of social justice with respect to diversity of culture based on what your contingent circumstances are. What cultural group are you a part of? Are you part of the majority? Are you one of these minorities? Are you a minority within a minority? There's a lot of different positions you might be in. And the urgency of the complications that happen around diversity might put certain things on your radar. You know, you might have certain things pop out a little bit more, other things pop out less. Um, and so there, there could be a way in which there's a risk of bias here, the same way that Rawls was talking about with wealth. Um, but <clears throat> maybe we can get over that a little bit, or at least see a path for how to um, address those biases by imagining ourselves under a veil of ignorance. What if I don't know who I am? Recognizing all these different positions that people could be in. What's a way of adjudicating what we want to give people special dispensations for, um, and which which things do we not? 
like what things should be universal rules that regardless of what kind of culture you're coming from or what community you're a part of there are some there's some things that are are not going to be contingently negotiable um, but are like more universal like when the feminist is saying things like uh, there can't be this kind of disenfranchise disenfranchisement of people based on their sex or gender that shouldn't be happening I don't and the feminist is kind of like I don't care what your cultural values are like that's wrong right there's, there's some some fundamental things um, Rawls is trying to figure out what might be those regulating principles like the Maximin principle, like the justice principle that he brings up, that people would agree to not knowing necessarily which person they are and what sort of cultural position they're in too. Um, that might be fruitful. There, there's maybe something to do in that direction. Um, so I, I thought that, that might be, a, it might be an, an interesting parallel. You know, Rawls is really thinking a lot about the economy and uh, people's economic positions. Um, <clears throat> but this maybe is the, the sort of Rawlsian theoretical framework may allow for uh, a similar pr pro productive analysis about these cultural issues too. And if Mark, you're thinking about the convergence between the kind of uh, progressive liberals and the, um, what was the, <laughs> sorry, the, uh, progressive left versus cultural left. Maybe this is another way to see them as as to, as combining. That there's some symmetry between them. Pierre's got something going on here. Love to hear. So th he says this may be a bad question, but. What makes you part of culture? Nationality, tradition, surroundings, how do you identify with a culture? Um, this is a really good question, Pierre. Um, it's, it, this would be another thing that we probably, that probably deserves some more analysis because it doesn't seem like it's a black and white sort of thing. It's not all or nothing. Um, well, I, I was just mentioning a second ago that I identify as Christian. It doesn't mean I participate with Christian cultural communities um, in the same way that other people do, or to a certain extent. I mean, I've lived most of my life not going to a church. <laughs> I'm a pastor's kid. <laughs> my dad was a pastor. Um, and a lot of my, the space of my life has happened independently of um, an institutional religious community. Um, but I would still say I participate with it. It's like, to what degree do you participate with it? Um, as a start of trying to answer this question, I would say <clears throat> there's kind of two things that might be going on. One internal, how much do you think about that when you're making decisions about what to do and how to live, how much do the values or principles or recommendations or prescriptions of a certain culture uh, or tradition um, influence how you think about what to do? So that's a kind of on an internal dimension. That could be more or less, right? There might be some parts of, say, a religious tradition that you do uh, treat as informing actions and other parts that you don't or that you don't think that it has bearing on or to, to you know, which pieces of it, maybe some you use and some you don't. Um, <clears throat> and remember, again, cultures themselves, we're, we're thinking maybe we shouldn't be centralizing them. They're always in flux and changing as well. This is a, you know, just get a, some generalized labels for things. But the internal dimension could be one. The second one is about how much you externally participate with a particular community. So a culture can also be not just a set of beliefs and values, but also actual people relating with each other in, in relationships, right, in a community. How much do you participate with that community? So using the religious metaphor again, let's say you do have a community of people that also identify as part of that religious tradition or that religious culture, how much time do you spend with them? How much are they a part of your life? How much do you do shared decision making with them? That might also be something that is more or less rather than kind of all or nothing here. Um, so the, the way in which your life integrates with an external world and your internal world are what strike me as the way to start answering that question, to recognizing that there are, there are dimensions on both levels. Uh, or ways in which that that uh, identification can be understood. 
Um, I don't know what you think about that as a suggestion. I don't know if the, that helps you, Pierre. Uh, I. I also would extend to you the same thing I've been inviting to other people today. Like, when you ask the question, I'm kind of curious, how would you answer it? You know, what do you think is a, is a good answer to that kind of thing? Mark says, can you expand on the difference between progressive left and cultural left again? Okay, so the basic idea is that the progressive left is focused on class issues and economic inequalities and injustices. And the cultural left is focusing more on um, rights of self-determination, the, the politics of recognition or identity politics. Um, <clears throat> they're focusing on the kind of culture tension that can happen, these questions of multiculturalism and diversity. Um, so those are, those are two different continuums of social justice, or two different facets of social justice that could be prioritized. And the question in that debate of the, that objection here, the reason why the progressive left is being brought into this conversation about multiculturalism is that some people see there being a kind of tension between that. Which one are you going to emphasize more? And emphasizing one might take away from being able to enact change on the other. That, that's what framed that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And Pierre, I saw you typing for a second and then, and then it went away. We can we can go back to your thread. Oh, I should probably put a code word in here. Um, <clears throat> let me think about that. We're getting closer to the end here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Mm. Uh, that's a good one here. Good code word today. Um, oh, I'm just, it seems like picking a code word should be the easiest thing in the world. I always have issues with it. Okay, I'll take that, Mark. You put it in there. Uh, Mark suggested the code word French fries, and we'll do that. We'll do that. That's kind of a fun, fun idea here. French fries are not French. Yeah, French fries is a code word. Yeah. Anthony says, I'm not sure if this is a solution for multiculturalism, but there definitely needs to be less stigma in having two nationalities slash having a foreign culture in this country. Yeah, um, one big thing that's on my radar, Anthony, um, that I'm always thinking about with this question is, um, oh man, I've got like a sneeze coming real bad. <clears throat> Um, oh, <clears throat> sorry, sorry for the distraction. Um, I think a lot about intersectional identities, like people who have mixed race or mixed cultural backgrounds. Um, and this comes up a lot when, uh, when I do the, the international business topic in my business ethics class about how, um, you know, there, there isn't... It isn't just like, which one do you sign up for? Which club are you in versus which club you're not? Some people, because of their circumstances, just don't have a club, right? That, let's say you, <clears throat> you, um, you have parents who come from two different racial groups or co racial communities or ethnic groups or that come from two different religious traditions or something like that, right? And both of them have influenced your upbringing and your character and your personality or you're a second generation immigrant, something like this, right? There can be ways in which you're not recognized uh, by people who more closely identify with those groups as really being like a full member of them. You like don't have a home anywhere. <laughs> you can't just like sign up and be like, well, I'm a part of this group. Yeah, that's, that's a given, you know? Um, so those, those intersectional identities um, are, present their own kind of unique complications, but also I think they may have something really important 
uh, that people who are not in those circumstances should reflect on. And so I'm, I'm kind of saying I'm kind of in agreement with you here, Anthony, that um, people want to know where are you all the time. And uh, that may be not so important or a, a distortion of what really is going on, that people have lots of different things going on with them. And just the same way that a culture is in flux, an individual person's identity can be in flux a whole lot. And there can be combinations of things. I mean, personally, I, you know, I identify as Christian and Buddhist, and I always get the question, like, how are those two things supposed to go together? <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you meld these? Or pe people wondering about the melding of um, uh, secular and religious philosophy, like how that can happen. Um, and there there's room for that. I mean, there's, a, just, there's even more diversity that can exist um, within the combinations of these things and within a, a particular individual circumstance. We don't all fit into these big one-size-fits-all boxes. Um, uh, Anthony goes on to say, I mean, think of all the great nationalities that came here in the 19th and 20th centuries that have dissolved into the American cultural monolith. Yeah, this, um, maybe you remember from the beginning of the article, Song talks about uh, how pretty much all these multiculturalists are against the melting pot. And the idea of the melting pot is that you got all these people coming from diverse places, but they all kind of meld into one thing, like that, that cultural monolith. And that's not the kind of integration of diversity that we're necessarily thinking is the ideal outcome here. Um, but it, there's a question of, in trying to still be an integrated society, how much conformity is required to do that? Or is that going to maybe happen anyway? Like... Um, uh, um, Mark's concerns about the loss of culture that can happen here too. Yeah. Pierre says, I would agree the external aspect, how much you participate in a culture or how big of a part of your life it may be, but how many culture can you interact with until it kind of devalues your association with a certain culture? Like, so like how many cultures can you believe in without contradicting yourself, if that makes sense? It absolutely makes sense. Um, to embrace every culture is kind of like trying to embrace all ethical theories. That doesn't take seriously the way that there can be disagreement and tension between them. And figuring out how to resolve that is a, is a major question. Right? You can't uh, agree with everything. Um, committing to one thing as being a value um, can prohibit you from valuing other things. And that's part of the stickiness here. If we value tolerance, what does that mean? What, uh, what other kinds of things might be no-goes or or the way that the like we were talking about the minorities within minorities issue the feminist is sort of saying hey if you actually have liberal values expressing them this way is inconsistent with them or certain ways that we might express it could be inconsistent with those values um, so I think Pierre you're absolutely getting at one of the core tensions of, of what makes this question such a sticky one um, and maybe I could offer that one of the solutions to this is to be able to have some tools and resources, maybe from philosophy or ethical theory, of being able to think about how different perspectives can um, be brought together in a way that doesn't have contradictions, and when it comes to things where there are contradictions that cannot be synthesized or integrated with each other, how to decide what to keep and what to get rid of what to hang on to and what not to hang on to. That just because something is an option doesn't mean it must be respected. That we can, we may have to pick and choose with some things and then you want to have some resources for making that discrimination um, in a way that's justified as opposed to unjustified. Um, there, there definitely are ways in which there can be perspectives that have something good in them and maybe some other things that are not so good in them. And then maybe it's a matter of deciding where you pick and choose that stuff. Um, how do you decide what stuff to hang on to and what stuff to leave behind? Um, even within cultures, not thinking about between them, they have serious questions to answer about that. What does it really mean to say participate in this religious tradition? Or what does it mean to participate in this culture? Do we want our culture to be based around this? Or do we want our culture to be based around this? Um, Camille says, or uh, Anthony says, I mean, the German Americans gave us the hamburger and they don't even speak German anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like a fourth generation German immigrant. Um, and at this point, I'm like, 
the only connection I've got is genetic. I mean, there's, and I like German beer a lot. I will say that, but, um, yeah, yeah, there can be there can be some loss there. Camille says, "Is culture something really necessary? Uh, it is the identity of an individual, but the authority it's coming from is not justified, in my opinion." Um, so one one reply to that, uh, Camille, is that culture is inevitable. And that, you saw a couple of the commentators in Song's article sort of mention this as like part of the context here, especially the post-colonialists. They're like, there's no way to opt out of a culture. You're going to have a culture. And as much as you have a society and there's some ways in which it's structured, there is a culture there. There's always culture. Um, so th maybe, maybe it's not something we can avoid to say that it's... Um, it, there's one question about whether it is necessarily valuable. There's another question of just is it metaphysically necessary? Is there some way that we can operate that doesn't have that going on whatsoever? And that might be pretty hard to do. Um, that there's some, as Thomas Nagel puts it, a view from nowhere. Is such a thing even possible? It might be, and this is where Rawls could be interesting, Rawls, uh, as another option here. Um, Rawls has got a way of acknowledging all the contingencies but in from a, a standpoint that maybe doesn't presuppose any of them, and that that's sort of the goal. So when you're talking about um, them having some kind of intrinsic authority, and that would be unjustified, um, maybe Rawls has a way of showing us a path to where we don't give them this kind of arbitrary authority, but we can still uh, think about what they have to contribute. There might be something morally relevant about them to be sensitive to. Sam's got something. Oh, we are, we've definitely, we've spent a lot of time. It's 11.32 right now. I kind of lost track of time. Um, I am happy to keep talking if people want to. Sam's got to go to work. Yeah, you're welcome, Sam. Thanks for being here, and thank you for participating. Um, I just kind of want to say to everybody, um, I, I kind of wish that we were going to, I was able to hear from some more people today, um, just in, in terms of uh, checking in about how the session went today. Uh, I wish I'd heard from some more of you. And I, you know, in the, you know, at this point, by the time this quarter's all over, about how I operate, I don't force people to to talk or participate. But um, if there's some stuff you want to chew on, like maybe some stuff from your reading comments for this reading that we never got to, that you still have questions about, or you just want to share with me what your perspective is and what your experience is with these issues, I would love to have that conversation with you. I know it's finals week. I know it's busy. Maybe after the quarter's over, we're gonna have these two weeks off together. Um, like I said at the top of the lecture. Getting a text or a call from you would be something awesome that I would welcome. Um, it would not you're not a bother. You wouldn't be bugging me or something. I I would love to have that conversation. Um, this isn't just a uh, my interest in having you participate in class today was not just for having the class be more robust. Although I do think that too. But I'm a, I'm just kind of curious to hear what you're thinking about, and to be a part of that conversation with you is a is a from my standpoint a special gift. So. Uh, if you want to give it to me, if you want to um, have that conversation somewhere down the road, uh, I'd be interested. Um, I think, like I, I said on Monday, this in, in the Weekend Update email, I think this multiculturalism topic is one of the most important ones to be discussing. And it's something I really like talking about with people and hearing their different perspectives, what's on your radar for what's morally significant here. Uh, that's beneficial to me, too. So um, I would look forward to talking to you. Uh, good luck with your response papers, finishing up our class, finishing up all of your classes, and I'll be thinking of all of you um, amidst um, the COVID-19 stuff happening. Uh, I hope you're able to stay healthy and stay safe and protect yourself and the ones that you love um, and, ev and everyone else in society too. Um, I know there's, there's going to be some complications already happening and will continue to happen and I wish you the best in that, and let me know how I can be a support too. If, if there is anything that I can do, I'm I'm here for you. So I want to let you know that. You're welcome. Bye bye. Thank you for a, a, a great quarter together, everyone. <laughs>